It has always been kept tied up. And for food, instead of oats and hay it has only been given straw, which is utterly worthless for its real needs. Never having seen in any of the manifestations toward it the least love or friendliness, the horse is now ready to surrender itself completely to anybody who gives it the slightest caress. In consequence of all this, the inclinations of the horse, thus deprived of all interests and aspirations, must inevitably concentrate on food, drink, and the automatic yearning for the opposite sex, hence it invariably veers in the direction where it can get any of these and if, for example, it catches sight of a place where even once or twice it gratified one of these needs, it waits for the chance to run off in that direction. It must be added that although the coachman has a very feeble understanding of his duties, he can nevertheless, even though only a little, think logically, and, remembering tomorrow, he does occasionally, either from the fear of losing his job or the desire of receiving a reward, show an interest in doing something or other for his employer without being forced to. But the horse, in the absence of a special education adapted to its nature, has not received at the proper time any data at all for manifesting the aspirations requisite for responsible existence, and of course it fails to understand, indeed it cannot be expected to understand, why it should do anything it therefore carries out its obligations with complete indifference and only from fear of further beatings. As for the carriage, which in our analogy stands for the body considered separately from the other independently formed parts of the common presence of a man, its situation is even worse. This carriage, like most other carriages, is made out of various materials and, furthermore, is of a very complicated construction. It was designed, as is evident to any sane thinking man, to carry all kinds of loads, and not for the purpose for which it is used by contemporary people, that is, only to carry passengers. The chief cause of the many misunderstandings connected with it springs from the fact that those who invented the system of this carriage intended it for travel on by roads, and therefore certain inner details of its general construction were designed with this in view. For example, the principle of its greasing, which is one of the chief needs of an equipage made of such different materials, was so devised that the grease should spread over all the metal parts from the jolting inevitable on such roads, whereas now, this carriage, designed for traveling on by roads, is usually stationed on a rank in the city and travels on smooth, level, paved streets. In the absence of any shocks whatsoever while rolling along such roads, the greasing of all its parts does not take place uniformly, and consequently some of them are bound to rust and cease to perform the functions intended for them. A carriage goes easily, as a rule, if its moving parts are properly greased with too little grease, these parts get overheated and finally red hot, and thus the other parts get spoiled, however, if there is too much grease on some part, the general functioning of the carriage is impaired, and in either case it becomes more difficult for the horse to pull it. The contemporary coachman, R. Cabby, has no inkling of the need for greasing the carriage, and even if he does grease it, 
he does so without proper knowledge, only on hearsay, blindly following the directions of the first comer. So, when this carriage, now more or less adapted for travel on smooth roads, has for some reason or other to go along a by-road, Something always happens to it either a nut gives way, or a bolt gets bent, or something or other gets loose, and so these expeditions rarely end without more or less considerable repairs. In any case, it has become more and more risky to use this carriage for its intended purpose and once repairs are begun, you have to take the carriage all to pieces, examine all its parts one by one and, as is always done in such cases, kerosene, then, clean them, and then put them together again, and frequently it becomes obvious that you have to change a part immediately and without fail this is all very well if the part happens to be inexpensive, but it may turn out that the repair is more costly than a new carriage. And so, all that has been said about the separate parts of that vehicle which, taken as a whole, constitutes a hackney carriage, is fully applicable to the general organization of the common presence of a man. In view of the lack among contemporary people of any knowledge or ability to prepare the rising generation for responsible existence in an appropriate way, by educating all the separate parts composing their common presence, every person of today is a confused and extremely ludicrous something, which, again using our analogy, presents the following picture. A carriage of the latest model, just out of the factory, varnished by genuine German craftsmen from the town of Barmen, and harnessed to the kind of horse which in the region of Transcaucasia is called a Gloszitzi. G, is a horse, VGLOZ, was the name of a certain Armenian expert in the art of buying and skinning utterly worthless horses. On the box of this stylish carriage sits an unshaven, unkempt, sleepy coachman, dressed in a shabby frock coat, which he has retrieved from the rubbish bin where it had been thrown out as useless by Maggie, the kitchen maid on his head reposes a brand new top hat, an exact replica of Rockefeller's, and in his buttonhole is displayed a giant chrysanthemum. Contemporary man inevitably presents such a ludicrous picture, because from the day of his arising these three parts formed in him, which though of diverse origin and having properties of diverse quality should nevertheless, for pursuing a single aim during his responsible existence, represent together his entire whole, begin, so to say, to live, and to become fixed in their specific manifestations separately from one another, never having been trained to give the required automatic reciprocal support and help or to understand one another even approximately thus later, when there is a need for concerted manifestations, these concerted manifestations do not appear. To be sure, thanks to what is called the system of education of the rising generation, completely fixed at the present time in the life of man, and which consists simply and solely in drumming into the pupils, by means of constant repetition to the point of stupefaction, numerous almost empty words and expressions, and in training them to wreck. 
Cognize merely by the difference in their sounds the reality these words and expressions are supposed to signify, the coachman is still able to explain after a fashion the various desires he feels though only to types like himself, and he is sometimes even able, at least approximately, to understand others. This coachman cabby of ours, gossiping with other coachmen while waiting for a fare, and sometimes, as it said, flirting in the doorways with the local maids, even picks up various forms of what is called humility. In accordance with the external conditions of the life of coachmen in general, he also gradually automatizes himself to distinguish Even though the Maleficent can 